So, thanks for having me here today. Uh, I know you guys have been watching Today in Georgia history, and I'm afraid you're going to have to suffer through that probably for the next eight months. This thing will go all the way through the end of your school year. Um, as you've been able to figure out, as you're able to figure out, this is a, a way to teach Georgia history every day. Um, it was an idea that uh, I work for the Georgia Historical Society, first of all. Uh, my job title there is Senior Historian. Um, when I was your age, I had no idea what I was. I always liked history, mainly because I was pretty good at it. I had a pretty good memory, which seemed to matter uh, for history. Um, when I got into college, I made it in journalism, radio, TV, film production uh, at University of Georgia in the journalism school there. And so kind of put that in my back pocket because what I really wanted to do was history. So I went back and got a master's degree in history at Georgia, took a couple of years and worked. Didn't like that a whole lot, it was what I was doing. And then I went back to the University of Florida and got a PhD in history. Now I was going to teach. I was going to be a college professor. So I hoped uh, and teach history every day to undergraduates. I did that in college. I was pretty good at it. It was fun. But I met somebody else took me in a different path in public history. I came to Savannah and started working at the Georgia Historical Society. I do all sorts of things there. What I tell people that I do is I get paid to think, write, talk, uh, about history all the time. Um, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense on some level, but what you saw today in Georgia history is one of the things that I did. Georgia Public Broadcasting approached the Georgia Historical Society and said, we want to teach Georgia history every day. In a fun way, short, nothing long, and we want you to help us do it. As we had had this idea for a radio show called The Day of Georgia History. Taya Ryan at Georgia Public Broadcasting said, why limit this to radio? There's a whole opportunity here to do it on television, and then put it on the internet, and then it will live in classrooms forever. We can inflict this on eighth graders forever. They'll enjoy it. They'll teach Georgia history. This is a great idea. Okay, we'll help you do that. We can write these episodes for you, and you can produce them, and we'll combine the best of what we both do. Well, Taya Ryan saw something that I did at Georgia Public Broadcasting a couple of years ago. We did a program on the Civil War. We invited some scholars in, they sat down on a panel. They asked me to moderate it. And I did. I asked questions, I had read their stuff, I sat with them on the panel, and it was on C-SPAN. It was recorded and broadcast on television. And Taya Ryan, who was the president of Georgia Public Broadcasting, saw this. That was not me. And she said, by the way, if you have so Make sure it's on side of the room. She said, you know what, we want Stan Deaton to be the face and the voice of today in Georgia history. And I said, whoa. I have never done that before. I don't have any experience being in front of a camera or really being on air. I have not done that. I guess I have a, a, a background in journalism. That was a long time ago. I have never really done anything. But this is where I learned a very important lesson, one that I would impart to you to remember as you watch today in Georgia history. As you probably have figured out, you're not watching a professional actor there. I'm just being myself, which is the other thing they wanted me to do. You're a professional historian. You will bring a credibility to this show that an actor probably doesn't have. But the other thing I learned is if someone comes to you with an opportunity to do something that you don't really feel like you're trained to do, that you really have any skills in doing, never say no. Learn how to do it. Never say no because. Stan, can you be the host of Today in Georgia History? No, because I don't know what I'm doing. No, because I have no experience doing it. No, I've never been on television. I said, yes, if. Yes, if you help me. Yes, if you put a good team behind me to help me learn how to do this and teach me what to do. Remember that. Yes, if. Never say no because. No, because I can't do it. No, because I'm lazy. No, because I just don't know anything about that. Yes, if. It will open all kinds of doors, as you can see. Stan, yes. can I ask you to do something? Do you mind just holding the lapel like it's a regular mic up to you? Because we're getting some uh, audience members asking what that sure. sound. Sure, I can do that. One of the many things you're asked to do, stuff like this. Dan, can you do that over again? It was terrible. Okay, <laughs> this is what we had to do. All right, is that better? Hold it like a microphone? That seems to be better. Okay, so we launched off on this project called Today in Georgia History. And they said, Stan, you're going to have to write 366 
episodes of this. Now remember that next time you're given a writing assignment that you have to do. I had to write 366. Why 366? And not 365, because that particular year was leap year. There was a February 29th, so I had to write an episode for that day as well. So we began assembling a team at the Georgia Historical Society that began acquiring all those images that you see. Nobody wanted to just sit and watch me for 20 minutes. Now we just lost our audience. <laughs> These are the sorts of things that happen in live television. Thank you, Sophia. You're welcome. Okay, I'm going to stand still. Not being around so, much. so I began writing madly, furiously. And our team that we assembled, there were about five people, began acquiring images from various libraries and places all over the country. Georgia Public Broadcasting told us that they wanted anywhere from 30 to 50 images for every single episode. And you can do the math. You should be able to anyway. 366 times about 30 or 50 is a ton of images. So we were madly putting that together. Georgia Public Broadcasting assembled a team of producers, video editors, lighting people, camera people, sound people. This was a huge enterprise. You see me sitting there or standing there every day, but there were about a hundred other people who were working on that show. It aired every night about 8.55 on Georgia Public Television. It was on the radio twice a day, and it ran for one full year, and then it was repeated for another year. Um, there were a whole host of issues we had to think about. Uh, you will notice as the year goes along that these get a little bit shorter, and I start talking a lot faster because we only had about 160 to 165 words in every episode. Now think about if you were telling the story of your life and you had 160 words. You have to leave a lot of things out and you have to get right down to the, to the, to the meat of the subject every single time. So it was a great exercise for me to learn how to write something. Wow, okay, now I'm free to walk around. Um, is that because no one's listening or because I'm talking loud enough? No, because everybody's listening said it was better when he walked away and it unplugged. Okay. <laughs> you guys didn't have to listen to me. That's it. All right. Where was I? What was I talking about? Writing. So one of the real skills I think that, that I took away from this and that I would again encourage everybody, anytime you can write something in a very short space, kind of like Twitter, but it's a little bit longer than that. I had more than 160 characters, but still, try to write something that tells a story and that sums it up at the end that explains to your audience why it's important and do it in 160 words. It's not easy. Now, if I gave you an assignment and said write 160 words, you might say, oh, Stan, that's a lot of words. It's really not. I mean, you have to do it every day, every day, every day, every day over the course of a year and talk about a whole range of subjects. And we cover everything, as you will see. There is not a subject in history from sports to economics to social history the popular culture, movies, television, music, everything is covered because we were desperate for subjects. When you have to cover an entire year, there's a lot of stuff you want to be able to talk about. Unfortunately, we were able to do that. So, um, generally what we would do is I would write about three of these a day. 15 a week, 30 about a month in two weeks. So I could write two months and four weeks. I would send these to my editors <clears throat> at Georgia Public Broadcasting. They would edit it. We would go back and forth, arguing about the words, fighting over what I was going to say. And we'd really, really get it down to a science. Then I would go to Atlanta, to the studios of Georgia Public Broadcasting, where we would actually record these. And as time went by, and this happened really pretty quickly, I was able to record two months in one day. So as you're watching those, You'll notice from day to day, the way I look is different, what I'm wearing is different, but they were all shot at the same time. What I would do is I would come out dressed like this, say, and we would do October 3rd, 7th, and 12th, and I would be dressed like this. Then I would go change my tie, and then we would shoot other days. And then I would go change my shirt, and then we'd shoot other days. And then the afternoon I change and put on a whole different suit. So that when you watch, every day looks different. I don't ever quite look the same. In fact, I would challenge you as the year goes along, there's some days, I, I think there were some ties I only wore once the entire year. That was another fun thing about doing this project. I got to buy clothes, which I love to do. Got to buy suits, a lot of ties, shirts of all colors and stripes. 
<clears throat> some things look better on television, particularly in high definition, than others do. But it was great fun to do this. It was a real challenge uh, to keep up this schedule through the whole year. And I hope what you see is, as, as the year goes along, first of all, I got a little bit better at it. I remember I wasn't trained to do that. Um, we actually started in August, but we didn't start airing until September, so it kind of gave me a month, but you guys probably started watching in August because we started school in August. So I hope as the year goes along, um, you notice that the show gets better, it gets a little faster, it gets a little tighter, because um, they really shaved off the amount of time. With that introduction, all that music, and then at the end, the stuff that happens at the end, we really had to squeeze the middle. One of the other things that we wanted to do with the Georgia Historical Society is make sure we got our identity out there, which is why I start every episode by telling you who I am. I don't work for Georgia Public Broadcasting. I'm Stan Eaton from the Georgia Historical Society. That's why I said that every day. And some people apparently did not understand what I was saying. They didn't know that was my name. They thought I was saying, I'm standing in the Georgia Historical Society. And I had a woman come up to me once and she said, why do you tell us where you're standing every day? <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. And I had a name tag on and I said, what does my name say? Look at my name and, and think about what you just asked me. And she got really embarrassed. She realized what that I was identifying myself every day. But that was one of the things we wanted to do, is it so people would hear the words Georgia Historical Society, Georgia Historical Society. And by the way, if you've never been, you should come over and visit us. We have a fabulous library. We go back to 1839 here in Savannah. We're on the corner of uh, Whitaker and Gaston, right across from Forsyth Park. So, let me ask you if you have any questions. I haven't watched today in Georgia history for a little while, um, for a month or so already. I assume you watch it every day. What are your impressions of it? Do we have any questions about it? What do you think about it? Is it something that you might like to do? Um, is it something you're already going to try in your classroom? See, I think it would be fun for each of you to write an episode of Today in Georgia History and then have to stand up in front of all your colleagues and do it. And do it flawlessly. Don't miss any of those words. I had a teleprompter that I could read on first. I didn't have to memorize any of that. But you still had to read and you had to be able to hit the marks. Stop when you see a period. If that starts a new sentence, don't just keep talking. Don't mess up. If you mess up, you got to start all over. Sometimes I'd get right down to the very end where the date was and I would mess up the date. It would be 1847 and I would say 1947. And I'd hear a little voice in my ear say, you got to do it again. But I do have to say I got pretty good at it in terms of it. we usually only had to do one or two takes to get through. So I'll open it up to you. You've learned a little bit about the production end of today in Georgia history. I know it's Monday morning. I know it's early. You guys look good. You look eager. You're ready to ask questions. What do you think about this? Who has a question? I'll make them up if you don't answer. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Been doing this, you mean, as a, like a historian? I have been in Savannah for 16 years. So I've been doing this since I got out of graduate school, since I got my doctor. Um, before that, I, I was teaching. I did teach uh, a little bit at the University of Colorado, which was fun too. Kind of did what I'm doing right now walk back and forth in front of students and talk about history for 50 minutes while they look at me kind of like this. <laughs> But they were all yes. What's your favorite episode that My favorite episode uh, is one that you will see in May. I think it's May 5th. I'm not sure. Maybe it's May 4th. I don't remember. But if you'll see. It's about the Rolling Stones, who uh, you may or you may not know who they are. This is the part where I start getting really old, by the way. <laughs> Rolling Stones, um, the rock group. Mick Jagger, moves like Jagger. Maybe you've heard of that. Mick Jagger was the lead singer, is the lead singer, still at age 70, of the Rolling Stones. They played Statesboro, Georgia in 1965, which you may know is right up the road for Georgia Southern. This was a huge big deal, and I have always been a Rolling Stones fan, so I was determined to tell that story. Um, I made a lot, a lot of really good connections, people who were actually there, who went backstage, met the Stones in 1965. The Stones were kind of like the Beatles. Yes, you maybe you've heard of the Beatles. Ask the Beatles. Did you mention the Beatles? Do you know what I'm talking about? Okay, you know who they are. Just need some feedback here. You know what I'm talking about. Who's heard of the Stones? You know who the Stones are? Okay, you know. We're just like two. All right. I actually went to see the Stones when I was in high school. I came to Atlanta. It was a huge, huge thing. It was when they were really, really big. 
I've been a lifelong Stones fan, so I wanted to tell that story. So it comes up in May. I didn't get to do it quite like I wanted to do it. This is the problem of having to work with editors and producers. Um, they didn't use the music that I wanted to use, but so be it. We told that story. There are a lot of good stories like that that I, that I had a lot of fun doing. We met a lot of interesting people. We have met a lot of interesting people through this who lived through some of this history, um, told us stories. It was really good. Other questions? Yes, sir. If there was anyone throughout Georgia history you could meet, who would it be? Wow. If there's anybody throughout Georgia history that I could meet, who would it be? Um, there are two people, probably. One of them is Jackie Robinson. Jackie Robinson. I keep wrapping these questions. These are all the questions, of course. But, um, Jackie Robinson is one of my heroes for all the probably obvious reasons. You probably all know the story. And we tell Jackie Robinson's story in January, I think. If I remember correctly. He was born in Cairo, Georgia, way down in South Florida. Um, I don't remember the year. Does anybody remember the year that Jackie Robinson was born? We all know the year. 1920 something, I think. But you'll learn that in January. Um, something to look forward to. But Jackie Robinson was, as you all know, the first African American to play Major League Baseball. And what he had to go through. A lot of people hated his guts. The simple fact that he's different. He's out there playing baseball with white people. And his story, I think, is inspirational. It's not easy being first. Sometimes it is. You think it is. Everybody wants to be first, right? You want to college football, you always want to be first. At the end of the year, in any sport, you want to be first. But when first means being spit at, cursed, have things thrown at you, humiliated, then when someone says, who wants to be first, everybody else backs up, not me. Jackie Robinson stepped forward, and he said, I will do it. I will do it so nobody else ever has to. I will walk through the door first and take all of that on me so that the other people who come behind me won't have to deal with that. So when you watch baseball, when you watch football, when you watch sports today, and everybody's out there playing together, you don't see any of that stuff going on now, in part because our society has changed, but one of the reasons it's changed is because Jackie Robinson changed it. He's one of the people. That takes an awful lot of courage. I'm inspired by stories like that in history. It's one reason I love it, one reason I wanted to do it. Courage. The other one is a very similar story. It's probably Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Again, the courage. There's something about that that, to me, is the story of what makes history so interesting. It's people who stand up and say, you know, this is wrong, and I'm going to stand up against it. Because it's so easy. You all know this. It's so easy to just let it go. Let things go. I'm not going to I'm not going to say anything. Like a teacher calling him. Man, I'm just going to stand here and I'm not going to make eye contact because he can't see me if I don't look at him. Right? We all do this. You sit in class, you know, you don't look at the teacher, then you, you're invisible. Both of these people I'm telling you about stood up and said, I'll be heard and I will be seen and I will make a difference. Those are the stories to me that are really interesting. Take it outside Georgia history, and one of the people, I'm taking my daughter. I have an eight-year-old who's in third grade. I'm taking her to Monticello this week for the very first time. You know what Monticello is? It's in Virginia, Thomas Jefferson's home. I find him to be inspirational for all kinds of people as well. Great figures in history. She's wanted to go and see his house since she learned about him in first grade. So, as you know, schools are closed this Thursday and Friday. We're going to drive up to Virginia and see Yes, Happy about that. We're going we're gonna to go up to Virginia and see Monticello. Now, Thomas Jefferson, to me, is interesting, and I'm going to hope that she gets this. He's the great apostle of freedom, right? He wrote the Declaration of Independence, stood up for human liberty and human rights, and was one of the largest owners of other human beings in our history. When I first went to the Jefferson Memorial years ago, when I was about her age, I remember standing there looking at it, and my mother said, very quietly, very casually, casually, all those words about freedom, and yet he owns slaves. I never forgot that. It's the American paradox that these great founders who set up this republic we all live in, where human rights and human dignity and human freedom are all championed, were started by people who believed in owning other human beings. There is a contradiction there that we still are trying to work through in our society. Yes, we don't have slaves anymore, but there's still all kinds of problems that we're trying to work through. So I'm intrigued by these people, how these people dealt with these problems in the past, because everything that you experience, somebody else 
at least you're all thinking you sort of think. We've reached the pinnacle of civilization, right? Because we're here now. Whatever those people used to do in the past, they just didn't understand. They, didn't. they were just dumb. No, they weren't dumb. They were just like you. Get up every day. They didn't think they lived in the past because they didn't live in the past. They lived in the present, just like you did. Every day was new. Every day was something great. 1847, they got up and said, we're here. It's 1847. We're here now. We have all the answers. They didn't, of course, just like we did. So all the things that you experience, all the things that you feel, the problems that you worry, the things you think about, other people have walked exactly where you walk. Think what you think, done what you've done. Maybe they didn't use Twitter. Maybe they didn't use cell phones. Maybe they didn't have smartphones. But believe me, one day you will laugh at the idea if you ever had to use a cell phone. People used to write letters to each other. This is one of my favorite stories. People used to write letters to each other. Put them in the mail. Took a couple of days, three days to get there. You opened it up. Man, this is great. I got a letter. You read it. Maybe a week later you responded to it. That seems so ridiculous now. But one day you're going to go, you had to pull out your phone. You had to slide it to unlock it. You had to punch in a code. Then you had to punch an app for email or text. Then you had to actually sit there and either type it in or say it. I can't believe you used to have to do all that your children will say to you, or you will think. Believe me, it will happen. We all think that we are sort of the height of civilization. You are for just a little while, for somebody else comes along behind you. That's a long answer to a short question. But that's one of the reasons that I love history. I love thinking about all this stuff. Seeing what people have done in the past. Other questions? Stan, we have our first Twitter question. Woo! <laughs> Yay! Um, and it is. Asked Dr. Stan, were there any segments or topics you really wanted to do for today in Georgia history but didn't get to do? That's a good, good question, too. Were there segments today in Georgia history that we wanted to do and didn't get to do? Yes, and I can't remember now what they are. <laughs> um, yeah, there were a lot of different stories that we thought this was going to go into a second year, maybe even into a third year. And we said, well, we'll just save these for next year. Uh, and we never did. We didn't get to do a second year. We didn't have funding for a second or a third year. Um, I'll, I'll think about that as we go along and come back to it. I can't remember now what those were. Uh, there were some very good stories. I mentioned the Rolling Stones. The Beatles played Atlanta. You guys may have seen this. It may have been a little bit early. That was in August. One of the first stories that we told when we actually had a lot of time to tell. Um, the Beatles played Atlanta Stadium in 1966. And uh, so we got to tell those are the kind of stories that I was interested in. The kind of stuff you don't normally see in a history textbook. Movies that came out, uh, music, sports, athletes. Uh, there were a lot of sports stories <clears throat> that we didn't get to tell, that I wanted to tell. Uh, we did talk about Hank here, and the big sports fans, so that was always important to me. There's a lot of University of Georgia stuff in there, too. There's a reason for that, not least of which is because I went to Georgia. but. Um, one of the sites that we used to help us think about what happened every day was put out by the University of Georgia, so there was a lot of UGA history in there. So I'll think more about that as we go along. Other questions? Yes, sir? What exactly is your least favorite subject in history that you've had to go over in the broadcast? Wow, that's a really good question. What is my least favorite subject in history that we had to talk about? Man, you guys are asking that question. My least favorite subject in history. What is your least favorite subject in history? I'll, as I stall for time, I'll ask you. I have to think about that. Um, we did a lot of stories that were, to me, now I challenge you, as you watch all year to figure out what they were, because I don't think you'll be able to tell, because I was enthusiastic about everything as I was talking. But there were some stories that uh, I just thought were real stupid. That we just had to do, you know, because there was either nothing else going on that day, and you wouldn't believe how much that happened. Um, and I don't want to tell you what those are, because then you'll, you'll, you'll remember this moment as I tell you that. But there were a lot of stories, I mean, me particularly, as I read about history, I tend to be less interested in economic stuff than, than other stories. Um, the stories of inventions or first, or the way something happened to change the way people think about it. 
like I mentioned Jackie Robinson and Dr. King. I think those are the stories that are most interesting to me. Um, other people who create things like businesses. We did stories about Home Depot. We did stories about Delta Airlines. These are businesses, ideas that people had that they created. Those are equally inspiring. They're really good stories. Um, I personally am probably less interested in those stories to explore them in a, in, in a greater context than today. Doing 160 words almost was fine with me. I just said that on the internet. But, but <laughs> there it is. I mean, that, that's that. But as you go through, and I, I should have reviewed all 366 episodes before I came in here. I could have told you precisely. There were some I really didn't want to do, but we didn't have a choice. A follow-up question? Yes, go ahead. You, well, you have to say what is violation. Yes. Something that would be violation that would be something, anything that does not really have any jump to it, you know, that has no yeah. uh, interesting part to it. Right. I would say. Yeah. So that's just flat out, okay, this is what happened. Yeah. There's nothing, you know. We did, I'll tell you, we did one show, uh, literally because there wasn't a lot to choose from that. You'd be surprised how many you think that there's a hundred different fascinating things that happen every day in Georgia history. And maybe there were, but I didn't know what they were. So we were limited as to what we could talk about. And one day, we talked about the Vidalia Onion. Nothing against the Vidalia Onion, right? People love it. My mother, if she is watching, loves Vidalia Onion. <laughs> I don't particularly care for them. It is not a story. I challenge you to make 60 seconds about the Vidalia Onion interesting. Stuff like that is hard to do. You're right. It has no jump, and that's a great way to put it. I mean, you're, you're sitting there starting with an onion. And that was one of the great challenges of this show. I'm sitting there going, I've got an onion, and I've got to do something with this. Um, and then we have to find images. We have to make it interesting. I have to sound interesting, look interesting, what are you talking about? So that, that was always There were lots of stuff like that as you go through. Inanimate objects, <laughs> flowers, bushes, vegetables, fruits, are hard to make interesting. And some days, Sophia will attest to this, we had to do that. Okay, next question. Yes, sir. Uh, what was probably the hardest part to uh, Hardest part uh, was simply doing that writing day after day after day. You sit down in front of the computer and having to write at minimum three shows. Some days I did more, but to keep us on schedule, it all started with me. I had to find a topic and I had to write about it. All those other people I mentioned, those hundred people, couldn't do anything until I wrote that script. So that was always difficult for me. Sitting down on a Monday morning, sitting at home, staring at the computer, and it just looks back at you, and it doesn't do anything. It doesn't inspire you. You just have to figure this out. That was always hard. Try it sometime. For the next month, write about something different every day, about 160 words. It is a challenge. And then do it again and again and again and again and again. 360 times. That was the hardest part for me. The most fun part was going to the studio and standing in front of the camera. Then it all came to life. That was great. Kind of like me standing here in front of you. I mean, there's a, there's a little bit, I think, in all of us, there's a little bit, you know, the closed door ham. Any professor, any teacher's got a little ham in them or they wouldn't be doing what they do. Right? Yes, sir. That's it. So performing, talking about something you're interesting in, interested in, was always fun for me. The challenge, too, of seeing that thing come out of nothing, the onion, and then talking about it, watching what producers can do with it is always fun too. Next question. Yes, sir. What is your least favorite part of my job? Man. <laughs> I don't know. I, there's not really anything I have to do I don't like, which is the beauty of having a job you like. Um, I don't have to grade papers. I like that. But that's <laughs> the other thing about being a teacher. I was going to be a college professor, and I had to get exams in those blue books. I don't know if you guys use blue books, but I was use blue books. The blue books just pile up, and I don't have to read through those things. So the beautiful thing about my job is I, I, I'm a teacher, but I don't grade the paper, <laughs> if that makes any sense. Nothing against people who do. It just wasn't my cup of tea. Um, I don't know. There, there's really nothing I do. That I, I, get, you know, I love to read history. I love to write about it and make it understandable to people who don't like it. And there's a lot of people out there who care less about history. I, I think nothing is more important. I, I, there's a talk I do about World War One, and people's eyes glaze over thinking, World War One. Oh, goodness. Everything about our world today, everything, comes out of World War One. And I can tell you why. What am I? It'll take too long, and that's not what we're here to talk about. But there's not many things that, I, that I'm not interested in, and so the job that I have allows me to talk about history. Um, I was in Atlanta last week talking to a group about history. Um, it's just fun. It's fascinating. 
It's not about memorizing things. Remember I said that's how I came to it in the first place? Because um, I was no good at science or math, but I could memorize dates, which all those years ago when I was in school was sort of what we did. Memorize dates, memorize names, president, king, that sort of thing. And I was good at that, but it's gone far beyond that. It's really about studying human beings and the way we interact, what we say to each other, what we think about each other, what we do to each other. That's what history is. You know, somebody invented this phone. Somebody came, you know, came up with all the guys. What did they do? What were they doing? What were they trying? Who inspired them? These are the kind of things that interest me. Next. Yes. What was your process to like choose the topic for each day? Throw a dart uh, and see what's stuck. How did I choose the topic every day? Um, there were some good websites that actually talk about, believe it or not, today in Georgia history or today in American history. Um, and I would start there, I would go just to get some ideas, look at the Encyclopedia Britannica, um, see what happened in history that I might be able to use. If I was lucky, I had two or three things I could choose from. And I would see what we did the day before and what we're going to do the day after. Because you always want to make it different, you don't want to do the same thing, you don't want to do sports for five days in a row. So that's what we tried to do, we tried to mix it up. Um, so that, that was sort of the process. There's nothing scientific about it. Some days I got really lucky. Some days it was packed. Some days there was just nothing going on. Um, I would pick a county that was created on a certain day, and we would then tell the story of the person for whom that county was named. You had to be resourceful, creative, think about you know, what we're going to do. Next, who has an answer to question? Anybody? OK. Repeat. <coughs> Who or what inspired me to do? A good teacher. A good teacher. Right? I mean, it's the way it is with most of us. Somebody who, um, the first year I was in college, one of my very first college classes, 17 years old, I'm sitting there at the University of Georgia, my first day, I'm nervous, I don't know if I can do that. How did I get to college? I fooled everybody. I'm here, I have arrived. I was in a classroom with 300 other people at the University of Georgia, a history class. <laughs> And a guy walked in, stood up on stage like I'm sitting here in front of you, and just lit the place up. Talking about history. I couldn't wait to get in the class every day. And I sat there and I thought, how can I get a job like this guy? How can I get this job? And it was a long, long road of education, staying in school. You kind of keep your eye on the ball sometimes, you kind of lose track of what you're doing, and forget what you're doing. I always remember his name is Carl Bifford. It just as an aside, he died this summer, and I actually spoke to the eulogy at his funeral. Because I wrote him a letter years later, and I told him how important he was to me. He didn't know it at the time. I was one of 300 people sitting there. He had no idea who I was. But he's the reason that I'm here, and I wanted him to know that. So I wrote him a letter one day, about six years ago. Dr. Bickerman, you don't know me, you don't remember me, but you inspired me on the path that I'm on. You're the reason I do what I do. I'm still touching other people's lives because you touched mine. He was so overwhelmed with that. He wrote me a letter and he said, when I die, I want you to read that letter. And I did. Did the Great teachers. <laughs> there you go, all, all the teachers. It's, uh, I, I, I believe it's the hardest job on earth, what your teachers do, preparing, coming in every day, trying to make something interesting. Even with all of you, lovely as you are, <laughs> day after day after day, it's an incredibly difficult job, underappreciated but the rewards are enormous. All of you will be inspired, I hope, by somebody, some teacher along the way, at some point in your career, and it may not be to college, but somebody's gonna touch something in you, a chord in there, and you're gonna go, wow, that's what I wanna do. Maybe science, good if you do math. But, I'm kidding, you all love me. You may be doing a geometry proof one day, and you're gonna go, man, that's it, that's what I wanna do. <laughs> because you may see a possibility there. Right? I mean, that's where the iPhone came from. Somebody had to know something about that and science to be able to do that. But you know what? They also do something about literature. These things all go together in some way to make us whole people and who we are. Next question. You know we what? actually Let's... have a Twitter question. Oh, good. Let's do the Twitter question. Uh, can you explain the role that personal bias plays in interpreting history? Can I explain the role that interpretive bias? First of all, what is interpretive bias? Do you want to know what that is? What, what's bias? What's bias? Like you are 
let's just say if there's a group of like let's just say if you pick one person to make a decision for the whole class and yeah you know yeah and you didn't ask the whole class that yep. would be it is all right remember a minute ago when i told you where i went to school I went to the University of Georgia, and then the University of Florida. We would be in the University of Florida, right? If you're a University of Georgia fan, you've got some bias toward other schools. We have a dark screen over here. I don't know what that means. Yeah. We've gone dark. You have a bias, right? We all bring our own attitudes and ideas to everything. If I said to you, what's your take on spaghetti? Or what's your favorite restaurant? It's hard to be completely unbiased about any of that, right? Because you've got ideas about those things. So if I said to you, what's your take on religion? It's whatever values you have, however you were brought up, whatever you've been taught, whatever you believe, whatever reading you've done to inform those opinions, that's all bias. You can't get rid of it. You can't. It, it makes you who you are. When you interpret historical events, if I say to you, Jackie Robinson was a hero, there are some people who would say, Jackie Robinson was an opportunist. He saw an opportunity, not to be a hero, but to make a lot of money, because Major League Baseball players get paid a lot of money. That's the only reason he did what he did. He wasn't trying to be noble. He wasn't trying to be a hero. He wanted to make money. Now you see, that's an interpretation, and it's a very different one than the one I just gave you. But that's what history is. Don't ever think for a minute that people who you're reading about, when you're watching a Steven Spielberg movie, right? And in, in, in October, next month, there's a new Brad Pitt movie coming out. I'm gonna go see it the first day. It's about a World War II group of guys on a tank. It follows them one day in World War II. As you watch it, and I'm sure it will be a great story, fascinating, riveting, good film and good history, there is a viewpoint that the people who made that film want you to take away. That's interpretive bias. You really can't get rid of it, and you don't need to. As you tell a story, as you look at history, as you think about God, as you think about politics, whatever, you bring your own ideas and your own values to that story, and the people who are telling you the story do the same thing. There is no truth out there. There's no pilot. People say, just give us the facts. Well, think about this show. These are the facts of the Civil War, let's say. Civil War happened between this year and this year. These are the people who participated. So I'm just going to give you the facts. Well, I'm going to pull out three of these books. Have I used all the facts? Of course not. I'm telling you a story. Robert E. Lee was a great general. What did I just say about Thomas Jefferson? Great man, apostle of liberty and freedom. What else did I say about it? Slave owner. Suppose I left out the second part. Have I given you all of the facts? No. And even if I give you both of those facts, what do they mean? They don't mean anything by themselves. They just kind of lay there. He loved freedom, he owned slaves. Does that mean he's a bad person? Does that mean he's a person of his own time and era? Does that mean what? It doesn't really mean anything until somebody interprets that. Somebody tells you he was quite typical for his time, but he also knew slavery was wrong. And what did he do about it? Nothing. Not really. What does that make me? What do we think about that? We're not quite sure. And that's how it is in history. We're not always quite sure. But facts are not something that you just go and drop and you go, well, there they are. They tell their own story. They don't tell their own story. You infuse them with life and they tell their story. You bring your interpretive bias to that. I like Thomas Jefferson. I have struggled for 40 years to figure out who he was. Why he did what he did. Same with Jackie Robinson, same with anybody. Are there other Twitter questions? Do we have any other questions here? Yeah, we have one more Twitter question. Okay. Oh, there you go. see if that makes sense. <laughs> there it is. Uh, did today in Georgia history win any awards? I say that's what that is. <laughs> yes, I was just about to tell you. One of the fun things that came out of all of this was we got nominated for Emmy Awards. Now, I did not even know when I started this process. Emmy Awards, of course, are given out for television. Oscars are for film. Emmy is for good television. We got nominated um, for two, two different nominations for the Emmys. And we won. Man, was that great. Well, it was. And I brought one here to show you. Here's our Emmy Award. One of the two that we got. Isn't that fun? I had no idea. Remember when I talked about opportunities when people come to you and say, can you do this? No, I can't. I would missed out on it. Now, if you told me when I was 17 years old, sitting there in that class, listening to that teacher, 
that one day I was going to have an opportunity and would win one of these? No way. Wasn't part of the plan. Wasn't anything I was going to do. Did you have to be some sort of performer to do this? In fact, you don't. I was in the right place at the right time and I took advantage of an opportunity. And we won two Emmy Awards. This one is for Outstanding Achievement in Television News and Program Specialty. And there's another one as well. Two of these in my office now. And that's kind of fun. Not a lot of historians have it. So I'm very proud of this. I'm proud of the team that won this. That's what it was, obviously, a team effort. I wasn't doing this by myself. But it, it's simply recognition that what we did had quality, it had value, it was good, it was fun. I hope it's fun for you to watch. I hope you learn some history along the way. History is not dull, not boring. Even the Vidalia Onion has its own quality. It might be interesting. <laughs> anyway, so the Emmy Award was a lot of fun. I'm going to put this up here. What other questions do you have? We can take about two more questions. Okay, good. Yes, sir. Um, if you could um, study or do any other country's history, what would you do? If I could do or study any other country's history, I thought you were going to ask me if I could just do anything about what I do. <laughs> uh, if I could study any other country's history, uh, and I did, uh, I read a lot uh, of history that has nothing to do with the United States or with Georgia. Um, it would probably be, uh, I can tell you, it's not so much a country as uh, uh, the history of the Enlightenment. When men like John Locke, like uh, Isaac Newton, first stood up and said, we can unlock the secret to the universe, right? The, uh, the sun doesn't revolve around the earth, the earth revolves around the sun. What, what does that mean? Aren't we the center of the universe? In fact, no, we're not. The first people, again, it's that idea of inspiring other people. The first people who stood up and asked new questions who were curious. I'm going to tell you right now, the best thing you can take with you through life is curiosity. Never stop asking questions because that's how you learn about things you don't know about. One day, that's going to impress people. It always impresses me when people ask questions because it tells me their mind is working. Ask questions. That's what I meant about there's no such thing as a foolish question. Ask a question. Ask, like these people do. So I read a lot about the Enlightenment, about People like Isaac Newton, like Galileo, people who, quite frankly, put their lives on the line for asking questions like that. Because if man is not the center of the universe, what does that mean about his relationship to God? If the sun is the center of the universe. And Galileo almost got toward it. So I read about that. I read about the history of England because all of our institutions, our government, our ideas mainly came from that country. We are an amalgam of people and ideas and places. Very pluralistic in that sense. Look that up. But our traditions of government, society, the things that we think and the reason our constitution looks the way it does comes out of Great Britain. So I, I read about I read about that as well. I read a lot about conflict in because I think that's important. That's one of the things as you go through life is how to work through conflict and work with people who are different. Begin with that idea of what do we think about each other and why do we think. About it? Why were people enslaved in the first place? These kinds of things. Was it simply because they looked different? Was there some germ they had that we don't have? Why do we think that's not good now? How did that happen? Was it just because they were bad people? It couldn't have been. Something happened at a particular time and place. These are the things I'm fascinated about. Why do things happen when they happen? People don't just wake up and say, it's time to invent the iPhone. Let's do it today. <laughs> we should have a war. Let's start World War II today. It's 1939. We should have started it two years ago. It, uh, history doesn't work that way. People make decisions. Things happen for a reason, and I'm fascinated by that. What decisions are you making right now that are going to affect the rest of your life? You may know, maybe you don't. But you are, and you will. You may win anyway. Okay. Something you're interested in. Something that just strikes your feet. You go, well, I shouldn't be interested in that. Well, maybe you should. Pursue it. So you're interested. Ask questions of people who know more about things than you do. And don't be afraid to ask questions. Keep asking. Any other questions? From, yes. Um, other than your favorite subjects, was there any specific subject that you remembered? Other than my favorite subject, are there other subjects I remember? Maybe because of my teachers. Yeah, you know, there were, I certainly remember my math classes because I struggled in math. Um, I didn't ask the right questions. No, I did ask a lot of questions and it didn't help. 
I just wasn't very good. My brain isn't wired that way, I'm afraid. Um, but I do. I remember, again, I remember the teachers more than the subjects. I think. Um, good teachers. People who inspired me to want to read about Galileo or to want to read epic poetry or to want to read great novels. Because I still do all of those things. Um, it sounds like work. It won't be. It's not. It's how you keep learning. And I think that's very important. You know, you think that, that your education comes to the end when you graduate from high school or you graduate from college. It doesn't, and it should. It's what makes life interesting. Learning about new things, and there's always stuff to learn about. So, 